Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. It's my pleasure this morning to be presenting at this special combined cardiology pathology grand rounds. We'll be focusing on COVID-19 and the heart. It's also my pleasure to be presenting with Dr. Heather Maioli, who is a resident in the Department of Pathology. We'll be presenting under the guidance of Dr. Desiree Marshall, who is the Director of Autopsy and After Death Services. And I'm Andrew Harris. I'm one of the cardiology fellows here at the University of Washington. The presenters have no relevant disclosures. As the number of worldwide cases has just reached above a million in the past 24 hours, it has been clear over the past several weeks that COVID-19 is a devastating illness that has significant global impact. What has also been clear from early reports from Wuhan, China, the initial epicenter of this disease, is that this is a multi-system disease where sepsis and respiratory failure are the primary modes of morbidity and mortality in these patients, but other organ systems are also involved, including the coagulation system, the kidneys, and the topic of conversation today will be the heart. Um, there has been a high prevalence of acute cardiac injury noted in these patients at about 20% in the early studies. When we combine that with anecdotal reports of severe cardiac complications that I'm sure many of us have heard about through social media, through personal communication with colleagues, this has heightened the concern. Many patients have been reported um, with stories that sound like this. A COVID positive patient with cardiac arrest with minimal pulmonary disease, rapid progression of cardiogenic shock, severe cardiac arrhythmias, and STEMI with non-obstructive coronaries, which even has its own hashtag, hashtag COVID STEMI. It's clear that between these anecdotal reports and the high prevalence of cardiac injury that has been reported, this has really raised the alarm bells across the medical community and certainly within cardiology. Coupled with that is the concern that there is a biologically plausible mechanism that the virus that causes COVID-19, um, which is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that this could actually cause direct myocardial injury. This is depicted here. Um, as all coronaviruses, the spike protein plays an important role in the pathogenesis of this viral infection. And in the case of the SARS-CoV virus, which caused the SARS outbreak in 2002, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is causing the current COVID-19 pandemic, this spike protein attaches to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, um, which serves as the functional receptor by which the virus then is able to um, enter the cell through endocytosis. Certainly, as a result, ACE2 has received a lot of attention in the medical literature. Um, and through RNA sequencing studies, we see that ACE2 is abundant in the lung, the kidneys, but also in the heart, which implicates that possibly these organs are more susceptible to disease. So from these early reports, I think the central question that comes to mind is, does myocardial dysfunction play a major role in more and mortality of COVID-19. And subsequent questions are, what are the cardiac manifestations and what are the underlying mechanisms of disease that connect COVID-19 to the cardiovascular system? So over the next hour, we hope to shed a little bit of light on these questions. I have the pleasure of um, turning it over to Dr. Maioli to present a very interesting case series of patients who died from COVID-19 in our region. After she presents her case series, we'll return back to look at some of the literature that has connected COVID-19 in the heart and end with some possible mechanisms of cardiac involvement before opening up for questions at the end. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Maoli. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Uh, so like Dr. Harris was saying, I'm going to give a general overview of some of the COVID uh, findings that we've seen at autopsy. Um, we've been very fortunate to have a couple of medical examiners offices in the region that have been willing to do these uh, high-risk autopsies. 
And then I will also give an overview on two patients, uh, one with typical uh, COVID symptomatology and a second patient with clinical evidence of myocarditis. Uh, I just want to let all of you know that this presentation contains data which is unpublished but is currently under consideration for publication. So when we were starting our autopsy series, we had a number of scientific questions of interest. The first being really what are the general findings in COVID-19 positive patients at autopsy? Uh, there have been relatively few case reports on autopsy findings on COVID patients, and that's due to a number of reasons, uh, mostly being lack of proper negative pressure rooms or lack of equipment. Uh, again, we've been lucky that there are two medical examiner's offices in the region which had the proper equipment, including N95s and PAPRs. And then is there histologic evidence of myocarditis or direct myocardial tissue injury? Dr. Harris gave a great overview of what our clinical questions are regarding COVID-19 and the heart. Is there evidence of acute kidney injury? Is there evidence of microthrombi? And is there any evidence of brain or brainstem involvement? And I will talk a little bit more about that later. So our general case series overview is we had 12 patients that had either COVID-19 positivity prior to death or after death, and they were selected for autopsy at both uh, King County Medical Examiner's Office and Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office. Um, Medical Examiner's Office are important for public health data in addition to their usual uh, task of determining cause and manner of death in uh, suspicious circumstances. Um, five underwent full autopsy and seven underwent a limited autopsy procedure. For the full autopsy procedure, it was your standard uh, typical autopsy where all the organs were removed, weighed, uh, received a full gross examination, and were sampled for histology. And our limited autopsy procedure was in an effort to reduce exposure to those performing the autopsy and to reduce aerosolization risk. So these organs were examined in situ. They weren't removed from the body. There were no gross organ weights. They didn't get a complete gross examination. And very importantly, there was no brain examination. The oscillating saw that we use to open the skull uh, creates a lot of aerosolization risk, and we didn't want to put uh, our folks at risk of catching COVID. So some selected features from our patients, the median age was 70.4 years, so they were on the older side. There was a good mix of male to females. Um, their median days from symptom onset, that is when they first started showing symptoms, not when they were admitted, was seven. But this was very variable. Some patients really presented with symptoms, were admitted, and died the same day, and others had symptoms for about two weeks before passing away. Many of them had antemortem COVID-19 positivity, but there were two that had postmortem confirmation. And this is because these autopsies were happening very early on during this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, and the amount of COVID tests was still quite small. So medical examiner's offices and funeral homes were doing an amazing job of collecting swabs on patients that uh, were suspected to have COVID. They all received uh, antibiotics prior to death. One of them had elevated liver enzymes, and I'll talk about that patient later. Uh, there were seven patients that had lymphopenia, which is being reported uh, from our clinical colleagues. And there were two patients that had secondary um, pulmonary infection, one with flu and MSSA, and another patient they had pseudomonas. Some of the comorbidities of our cohort included uh, cardiovascular disease, the main comorbidity being hypertension, and coronary artery disease, pulmonary uh, comorbidities, including COPD, metabolic, including diabetes and obesity, renal, quite a bit of these patients had chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease on dialysis, neurologic, including uh, traumatic brain injury with subsequent dysphagia or uh, dementia, and a couple of these patients did have a history of cancer. So the first case I'm going to present is a patient with typical COVID symptomatology. 
So this is a male in his 50s who, uh, with a past medical history of end-stage renal disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and obstruct obstructive sleep apnea, who was feeling quite ill for four to five days with a low-grade fever, poor appetite, some dizziness. Um, when he started to have a little bit of trouble breathing, he went to an urgent care and was found to have coarse breast sounds on a physical exam and was also found to be hypoxemic. So the urgent care sent him to the local emergency room where he received chest x-ray and was found to have bilateral patchy airspace opacities, which seems to be a common chest x-ray amongst COVID patients. He was admitted to the medicine floor that night on BiPAP, but he really rapidly uh, declined as far as his respiratory function and was intubated overnight and admitted to the MICU. Really over the next five days of his hospitalization, he had worsening fever um, despite antibiotics and his infectious workup was negative. So negative viral panel, um, no bacterial growth. And he eventually had progressive respiratory failure and death five days after admission. And he did have a positive nasal swab for COVID. So I'll start with the pulmonary evaluation. And um, this, this portion contains some findings from this patient that I just described, as well as some patients from the rest of our cohort to kind of give a general overview of some of the spectrum of COVID pulmonary findings. So this gentleman had pulmonary edema and congestion on gross examination. And when we say edematous lungs on gross examination, uh, when you're holding the lungs at autopsy, you can squeeze them and kind of fluid comes out. So his lungs were quite heavy, so you could see the normal range. For a right lung is 360 to 570, and his was well over that uh, at 1255, and his left lung was 1065 um, with a normal range of 325 to 480, so over twice uh, the normal weight of a lung. We didn't see any gross evidence of consolidations, which would make, make us think of a bronchopneumonia. We didn't see any acute hemorrhage, and we did not see any pulmonary thromboemboli. So this is a low power view of the lung. You can see some cartilage on the right uh, from a large airway. And this uh, slide is very eosinophilic and that's secondary to autolysis. Uh, you can see these air spaces have bubbly edema within these alveolar spaces. Here's a close up of kind of the same picture. So we see this eosinophilic edema within the airways with some epithelial sloughing. So what we mean by that is some of the cells that should be lining these air spaces are kind of falling off and into the air space. You can see some of these cells here. And these cells are larger, they're reactive, they have big um, nuclei. And that's something that we could see in any kind of lung injury. This is a similar picture with another reactive cell, which I'm going to point out here. So this cell, again, uh, he has a, the cell has a large nucleus with a prominent nucleoli. So that makes us think that this is a very reactive cell. And again, you could see that in the rest of this picture, we have a number of these cells sloughing off into the air spaces. But this can be seen in various types of lung injury. It's not specific. And this picture is showing a multinucleated giant cell. And multinucleated giant cells were something that were appreciated in a subset of our cohort. So it wasn't, they were not prominent finding, but they were present in a, in a subset. And these giant cells were actually something that was also seen in the original SARS. And that makes sense since these two viruses are related. And then this is just pointing out some congestion. This picture shows some cyto intracytoplasmic inclusions, um, as you can see here. So we see these basophilic uh, granular uh, particles within the cytoplasm. And they, there were some ultrastructural studies on the original stars that suggested that there was some nuclear protein aggregates uh, identified in the cytoplasm. Um, it's really unclear what their importance are, but we did see these basophilic inclusions in a number of these reactive cells. This is a picture of the patient's trachea, and it's kind of hard to appreciate, but really in the center here, it looks a little congested and hyperemic. And when we looked at this under the microscope, 
we saw some edema as well as congestion. So this kind of loose stroma is the edema, and then we've got some congested blood vessels below. And this isn't surprising. So all of our patients, unless they had a do not intubate order, were intubated. And here are some additional pulmonary findings from other patients with COVID. So here we have a eosinophilic inclusion in the cytoplasm. Again, we don't know whether these are viral inclusions. They very well could be, uh, but more research is needed. And this was only seen in one patient, so this was not a prominent finding. And then we have some possible imperipoesis, uh, which has been reported on, but again, this was seen in one patient, so this was not a prominent finding. This is a picture of some hyaline membranes. So 75% of our cohort had some kind of diffuse alveolar damage, whether it was in the acute phase or the organizing phase. And when we think of uh, acute, uh, acute alve alve uh, diffuse alveolar damage, we think of hyaline membranes as being a real hallmark feature. And there are these waxy uh, strands. Uh, what was interesting was that despite how long the symptom uh, metology was, we saw there an organizing phase in both people that had very short symptom to death intervals and those with very long uh, symptom to death intervals. So here we see a fibroblastic proliferation, which is more in keeping with a organizing phase of diffuse alveolar damage. And this is interesting because early studies out of SARS suggested that patients that had longer symptoms and kind of carried this virus longer had lung damage that was more consistent with an, an organizing diffuse alveolar damage phase, but we kind of saw this in both cohorts of patients, which makes us wonder whether there is an asymptomatic period where there is still lung damage happening. Um, or whether these patients were dying of something else causing this lung damage and that just happened to have COVID. And that's still very unclear at this point. Now onto this patient's cardiac evaluation. So he had a very heavy heart. So normal for a gentleman would be 270 to 360 grams and his was 685. You can see that there is biventricular dilatation with the right ventricle looking a little more dilated than the left. But we didn't see any evidence of, uh, gross evidence of remote infarctions. And this was his coronary artery. So this is his proximal LAD. So he had focal 45% stenosis, um, but his other coronaries were clean. This is just a low power view showing the extent of his chronic uh, cardiac disease. So he has a lot of interstitial fibrosis. So that's all of that light pink in between the cardiac myocytes. And he has an area of replacement fibrosis in the lower um, left-hand corner. So that means that that light pink fibrosis is really uh, getting bigger. And this is consistent with some chronic ischemic injury. We didn't see any um, acute myocyte damage and we didn't see any increased inflammation, which would make us think of myocarditis. So some additional findings, uh, he had granular kidneys, um, that makes us think of hypertension, and he did have a history of hypertension, so that goes along with his clinical history. And his kidneys had quite a bit of chronic damage, so he had end-stage renal disease on dialysis, so this is not surprising at all. Um, but he had global glomerular sclerosis, he had some interstitial fibrosis, and he had some Kimmelstown Wilson nodules, which are something that you can see in diabetes, which he also had. Um, so these are all, again, chronic changes that go along with his chronic kidney disease. And you might see a little bit of chronic uh, lymphocytic inflammation in the background, but that also goes along with his chronic disease. His liver was heavy. It was pale. Um, and you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the liver that there is some kind of brick red color to it that looks a little nutmeggy, and that makes us think of congestion. And his liver was congested. There's all these fat droplets within the liver, which is steatosis. So he had micro and macro vesicular steatosis, which is a finding that has been seen and reported on in other COVID autopsy patients. Um, and he also had these really cool Mallory Dank bodies, which are eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions in hepatocytes. 
in people that have certain types of liver disease. It's really not specific. It can be seen in a number of conditions, including cirrhosis, obesity, um, carcinoma, amongst others. So, and he didn't, he was, he had obesity, but he didn't have anything else. Um, but the macro and microvesicular steatosis in these patients, the etiology is really unknown. It is unknown whether this is due to COVID infection or due to the patient's underlying conditions. Uh, or maybe antibiotic use during surgery or during uh, hospitalization. And this is a picture of a spleen. This didn't come from this patient, uh, but there has been some reports that there was reduced spleen weight in some of these patients that were COVID positive and had autopsies. Um, we didn't see that in our cohort. They all had normal to maybe slightly larger spleens, um, but three patients did have reduced white pulp. So you could see kind of in the upper corner, there is some like lymphocytes, that's our white pulp, and there really should be a lot more of that. So it's, we called this reduced white pulp. So this patient's cause of death was COVID-19 pneumonia, and we called, uh, we said his contributing factors were diabetes and stage renal disease on dialysis and hypertension. So now I'm going to talk about the second patient, and this is a patient with different symptomatology this is a woman in her 70s who returned from a recent trip to Egypt, Jordan, and Germany. Uh, she was starting to feel unwell towards the end of the trip. Uh, a friend that she had gone on the trip with actually had kind of upper respiratory symptoms for about a week prior to this patient becoming sick. And right before returning to the United States, you know, she started to just overall feel tired, unwell. Um, with a fever. Um, and after three days of feeling unwell, she went to the emergency room where she had a fever of 38.3. She was tachycardic at 114. Her blood pressure was low at 78 over 39. And her SpO2 was 70% on room air. And just like the first patient, she had diffuse pulmonary opacities on chest x-ray. And her respiratory function very rapidly decreased. So unlike the first patient who was able to kind of linger about a day before needing to be intubated. She was intubated very soon after arriving in the ED and she was started on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, so her initial evaluation that showed that she had a high white count with lymphopenia. Uh, she had elevated liver enzymes. Her lactate was 4.6. Her initial troponin was 11.5 and she did have positive flu testing in the ED. Um, she also received an echo, which showed um, an ejection fraction of 30% with heterogeneous wall motion abnormalities. And it is worth noting that this patient, prior to the sickness, was very healthy. So according to her husband, her only um, past medical history was really some uh, hyperlipidemia and osteoporosis. Otherwise, she was a woman that was going to the gym every day. She was very active. Um, so she really didn't have any evidence of cardiac or respiratory disease prior to being sick. So this echo was very um, surprising. Over her hospital course, um, her troponin did downtrend. Uh, she had dusky fingers, was very poorly perfusing. She kept getting a high fever, worsening respiratory failure. She was on pressors. She was on very high vent settings. Her COVID test was positive. On day four, she ended up having unstable AFib with RVR, treated with amiodarone. And she really continued to go in and out of AFib uh, during the remainder of her hospital course. And then on hospital day six, um, she continued to have respiratory failure and shock despite her other labs improving. So her liver enzymes got better, her lactate improved, uh, her creatinine improved, but her respiratory failure did not. And they transitioned her to comfort measures and she passed away. So this, the question for this autopsy was much more specific. Was there evidence of myocarditis? Just to look at her pulmonary findings briefly, she also had very heavy edematous lungs. She didn't see any consolidation. So again, no evidence, no gross evidence of bronchopneumonia, no acute hemorrhage, no pulmonary thromboemboli. This patient, um, it's a low power view. You could see some fibrin, intraalveolar fibrin 
So we've got some fibrin deposition within the airways. And then you can also see some hyaline membranes. So this is really consistent with an acute phase diffuse alveolar damage. She had edema in her lungs. And again, some hyaline membrane formation. Here again, we have congestion and some reactive looking cells uh, with big nuclei and uh, hyperchromasia. And she had some prominent squamous metaplasia, which again could be seen in really any kind of lung injury, so this is not specific, but was an interesting finding. Her trachea likewise was congested and edematous, and she was intubated for quite a while. And the very cool thing about this case was we had done an autopsy on this patient really after our initial group of autopsies. So we had been able to look at the histology for our first group of autopsy patients, come up with new questions we wanted to ask. And one of the questions that we had was, could we isolate this uh, virus on electron microscopy? Could we find it? So we collected some fresh tissue to run EM studies. And the EM lab was able to run some EM on a number of her different tissues, but this is coming from her lungs. And we can see some double vesicle formation with uh, mem uh, no, yeah, spherical double membrane particles. So here's a close up with the little spike proteins. So consistent with COVID. So now onto her cardiac evaluation. So when we think of myocarditis in pathology, we think of the heart having increased cardiac inflammation and acute myocyte damage. So we really need to see both to call it myocarditis. Her gross exam was notable for cardiomegaly at 490 grams, um, but she did not have significant atherosclerosis at all. And she did not have any evidence of remote infarction. The vast majority of her heart looked like this. So when we look at this picture, we see cardiac myocytes, we see some interstitial spaces, and you kind of get the impression that it's a little more cellular than we're used to seeing. Um, but there's no large collections of uh, inflammatory cells. And like I said, the vast majority of her heart looked like this, but there were some areas where we were seeing some increased lymphocytes and some myocyte damage. So you can see the lymphocytes kind of trickling along here. And then on that second arrow, you see some of these myocytes falling apart and looking stringy. So that's acute myocyte damage. And that explains why her troponin was so elevated. Here's another picture showing some cardiac myocytes with some increased lymphocytes in the background. And we do see some uh, interstitial widening. Um, which could be edema, and that could explain why her heart was large, or heavy, if you will, and some increased lymphocytes with associated myocyte damage. Here's another area of her heart. And here's just a close-up showing some increased lymphocytes and myocyte damage. So histologically speaking, this is myocarditis. So we answered that question. Now the caveat with this patient is she was also positive for the flu and the flu is known to cause a viral myocarditis. Um, so whether this was due to COVID infection or due to the flu is really unclear. But to answer the question, did this patient have myocarditis? Yes. Uh, onto her liver evaluation. So just like the first patient, she had um, macro and microvesicular steatosis, and this patient also had central lobular necrosis with some bridging. And that's consistent with shock liver, and that goes along with her clinical presentation of having elevated liver enzymes on admission. Here's just a close-up showing the necrosis. Um, you could see some congestion in the background by these dilated spaces and then some bridging. So it's kind of off the picture, but there's another area of necrosis that 
and the two are bridging. So one uh, of the questions was really, is there any brain involvement in patients with COVID? And that's been a difficult question to answer for a couple of reasons. One being that there hasn't been a lot of autopsies in general. And the second being that even in our autopsy cohort, we did not take the brain out of many patients. So again, we only did five complete autopsies and that's really due to the, the oscillating saw causing some aerosolization and wanting to reduce that risk. Um, with that said though, there have been a number of reports either talking about an encephalitis or wondering could some of this respiratory decline be central and due to some effect of the virus on the central respiratory centers in the brain. Um, there have been some questions about losing your sense of smell. Um, so there's definitely, you know, just like the heart, there's some interest in the brain. So in this patient, when her brain was examined, something that was interesting was she had these diffuse punctate subarachnoid hemorrhages, which really hasn't been described before. Um, and we really don't know the significance of which. There's one of them. And then another interesting finding was, you know, like I said, there's, there are these questions of whether COVID has any effect on the central respiratory centers. Um, is there any effect on the brain stem? And there have been some suggestions from SARS and MERS that maybe the virus really does affect the brain stem more than some other areas in the brain. Um, and when we did the neuropath evaluation on this patient, she did have these um, hemorrhages in her brain stem, but really nowhere else. So that's interesting. We don't know the significance of this, but it makes us wonder. And then uh, this patient also had PCR, um, courtesy of Ben Bradley, on a number of her tissues. And really unsurprising, we were able to get the highest levels of virus in the lungs um, and the trachea. And she also had some in a subcranial lymph node. We had lower levels, but positive levels in the heart, liver, spleen, and large intestine, which is really in keeping with what Dr. Harris was saying earlier. This ACE2 receptor is in many organs, and that could explain why there is multi-organ involvement in these patients with COVID. So to summarize case two briefly, so her cause of death was acute respiratory distress syndrome due to viral pneumonia due to COVID-19. And her contributing factors were influenza A, staphylococcal pneumonia, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and septic shock. And again, we, even though we saw evidence of myocarditis, her picture is complicated because of her dual viral infection of COVID and the flu, which the flu is known to cause myocarditis. So some things that were missing in our autopsy cohort is that we didn't include, or we didn't have patients that were described with a new onset cardiomyopathy or conduction abnormalities. And it would have been really interesting to see what was going on in the hearts of these patients. Um, as they're able, the local medical examiner's office are gonna continue to perform some of these COVID autopsies uh, to help address some of these questions and other questions. And we do have autopsy results pending for a patient with complex cardiac history who presented with bradycardia and AV block and was found to have COVID. So stay tuned for more. So some overall findings and take home points. So just kind of summarizing our overall histologic findings in our 12 patients with COVID is the vast majority of these patients had really reactive looking pneumocytes, which is something that was seen in the original SARS, but is something that's totally nonspecific and can happen in other types of lung injury. A lot of them had very heavy edematous lungs. There was some kind of diffuse alveolar damage in 75% of these patients. Um, and a number of these patients had some uh, bronchopneumonia, bronch uh, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, um, and other findings included uh, just some chronic changes, for example, myocyte hypertrophy or interstitial fibrosis in the heart, um, or some chronic changes in the kidneys. So some take home points. Um, these pathologic findings are very much new. They're still under investigation. It would be great to have much larger autopsy studies on these patients. 
Uh, a lot of the findings that we're seeing are very similar to SARS-CoV, and that makes sense since these are uh, in the same family. But it is unclear at this point which path pathologic findings are due to COVID or due to some of the under underlying conditions for these patients, some medications they had, or maybe some co-infections that they had, and really more research is needed. And before I uh, turn it over to Dr. Harris, again, I just wanted to thank our patient and care teams. I wanted to thank Dr. Harris and the cardiology group for inviting us today uh, and all of these other folks. So thank you. And Dr. Harris, you could take over again. Okay, well, thank you very much for that presentation, Heather. That was very informative. And I just wanted to commend you and um, your whole team um, for producing that information. That's going to be very helpful to the medical community as we go forward taking care of these patients. So I wanted to change gears a bit and talk about the literature that supports the connection between COVID-19 and the cardiovascular system. Before I do so though, I wanted to take a brief moment to um, make one comment that the literature is very much in its infancy at this point that connects COVID-19 and the cardiovascular system. And I, I think that we have to be very cautious and critical of the, the limited amount of data that we have right now before we um, start um, providing broad reaching recommendations that can impact patient care significantly. But with that caveat, um, let's take a look at the literature that currently exists. So this is a study that came out of The Lancet um, from Wuhan, China a couple of weeks ago that showed, that looked at 191 patients that were hospitalized for COVID-19. And they showed that among those patients that died during the hospitalization, there was a higher prevalence of baseline cardiovascular comorbidities shown here, hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. They also showed that um, these risk factors were associated with mortality on a univariable analysis. Um, but when they did multivariable testing, they did not show um, them to be independently predictive. Another very important observation that came out of this study was the high incidence of acute cardiac injury that they're seeing in their patients. It's important though to note that the definition that they used for acute cardiac injury was um, an elevation of high sensitivity troponin greater than the 99th percentile of normal. Using this definition, they found that 33 or 17% of 191 patients had evidence of acute cardiac injury. And those patients that died during the hospitalization um, manifested acute cardiac injury more frequently. What's very important in terms of the information that's lacking in the literature is we know very little about the actual clinical manifestations of these patients with acute cardiac injury. The authors do report that 23% of the patients had heart failure, but they provided no echocardiographic data and they also did not provide any criteria by which they gave a patient the uh, diagnosis of heart failure. So I think we have to interpret these findings with a great deal of caution and we also have very limited information about other clinical manifestations of cardiovascular disease in these patients. Another center looked at the prognostic value of troponin in COVID-19 illness. And they showed that in patients that have an elevated troponin, here shown by cardiac injury, that these patients had a very poor prognosis with an overall 50% in-hospital mortality. And that's as compared to um, a relatively benign prognosis in patients that do not manifest acute cardiac injury. The question that comes out of this is how much of this is the heart driving the clinical outcomes versus the heart being a bystander and troponin merely being a marker of more severe infection and potentially just a reflection of multi-organ dysfunction. Another important thing is to put this elevated troponin into context of other illnesses. This 
um, connection between COVID-19 and troponin elevation is not unique. Certainly, we see this frequently in patients that have severe sepsis and septic shock, and has also been associated with increased mortality in a number of different disease processes. Several studies have looked at elevated troponin in severe sepsis and septic shock and showed that a, there's about a 60% prevalence of elevated troponin in this setting. And in patients that are treated in the medical ICU setting, those with elevated troponin have been shown to have about a threefold increase in mortality. Importantly, when we have looked at the underlying mechanism for the elevated troponin in small studies where they systematically looked for coronary disease, there were low rates of obstructive coronary disease making CAD and myocardial infarction unlikely to be causing this and more likely due to the underlying sepsis. As I mentioned, we still have very little information about the actual clinical manifestations of acute cardiac injury. Some of the data that we have come from Evergreen Hospital, um, who recently reported um, outcomes of 21 critically ill patients, and they showed that 7 or 33 percent of these patients developed new onset cardiomyopathy, which was defined by a global decrease in systolic function by echo. But that's really pretty much where our information on the clinical outcomes as specific to the cardiovascular system, that's where our information pretty much stops. So I wanted to revisit the initial question that I posed, which is, is cardiac dysfunction a major cause of morbidity and mortality in COVID-19? I think the short answer to this question is, we just don't know yet. I think it probably is in a subset of patients but what percentage of those patients have severe complications from COVID-19 related to the heart is still very much unclear. I do think that it's likely to be less than the total 20% of patients that have elevated troponin because not all elevated troponin equates to clinically significant cardiac dysfunction. What is clear though is that over the next weeks and months, we as cardiologists are going to be facing uh, facing patients that have evidence of acute cardiac injury and cardiac dysfunction. And I think it's important for us to be thoughtful about what the potential underlying mechanisms of this cardiac dysfunction could be. I would propose that it's likely to be a result of one, of, one or more of the six following uh, possible mechanisms of cardiac dysfunction. And it's likely to be a heterogeneous process, meaning that it's not the same for um, different patients. But I would propose the following six. Exacerbation of underlying cardiovascular disease, acute coronary syndrome, and type 2 MI. I would include into that microvascular thrombosis that has been seen in some organ systems. I believe sepsis and cytokine mediated will be an important feature. Stress cardiomyopathy, and as we talked about and Heather so nicely um, discussed earlier, myocarditis. Um, certainly we think that we have a probable um, COVID-related myocarditis um, case that we discussed earlier, but I don't want the takeaway point from this presentation to be that all patients with new cardiac dysfunction or elevated troponin have myocarditis until proven otherwise. I think there's multiple potential factors here. So to look into a select number of these briefly, in terms of exacerbation of underlying cardiovascular disease, this was nicely demonstrated in another article that came out in the past couple of weeks um, from Wuhan, China, where the authors showed that patients that had underlying cardiovascular disease had fourfold higher rates of, of troponin elevation during the hospital course. And furthermore, those that had both cardiovascular disease at baseline and elevated troponin had a worse prognosis than those patients, their counterparts, um, without cardiovascular disease at baseline. The next few mechanisms, we have very little information about the connection between COVID-19 and these possible mechanisms. So I will look to analogous disease processes to um, really try to draw a, a potential link between COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. It is well known that influenza is associated with um, increased rates of acute myocardial infarction. 
And some have proposed that a similar process may occur um, related to COVID-19 infection due to the pro-inflammatory state. Um, this, was, this connection between influenza and acute MI was nicely demonstrated in an article published in the New England Journal two years ago that showed that patients that were diagnosed with influenza had much higher rates of myocardial infarction in the seven days following the confirmed diagnosis of influenza. And this then dropped back to um, the baseline risk over the next um, year. The cytokine response is also likely to be very important in COVID-19, as has been observed by um, the early experience with taking care of these patients. The cytokine response has been better characterized in the context of the SARS outbreak in 2002. And here you see um, the various, various cytokines that could be involved in the response. Interestingly, it looks like IL-6 plays an important role in the inflammatory response, whereas uh, where, where we see that there's significant elevation in the IL-6 concentration in those that have SARS and certainly more elevated in patients with severe SARS. But other important cytokines do not show a similar response. When we look at preliminary and early data from COVID-19, we see a similar trend that IL-6 is higher in patients that die during the hospitalization. And the authors have shown that IL-6 concentrations are associated with mortality in COVID-19. What's interesting is that IL-6 has previously been shown to actually cause um, direct myocardial dysfunction, both in an acute and delayed phase. Um, this has been shown in several studies, but this um, figure here nicely shows the dose-response relationship between IL-6 and myocardial contraction, in this case, in the isolated myocardial cell. Clearly, IL-6 also plays an important role in the inflammatory cascade. Some people have looked to the cytokine release syndrome, which is a syndrome that results um, from novel therapies such as CAR T cell therapies for the treatment of hematologic malignancies. And in this process, there is an intense inflammatory and cytokine reaction that ultimately leads to end organ dysfunction. In this syndrome, cytokine release syndrome, we see that patients can develop significant cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias um, related to this inflammatory signaling. What's interesting is that it seems that IL-6 plays an important role here. And when tocilizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the IL-6 receptor, which inhibits its function, we see that um, it has been shown in preliminary studies that end organ dysfunction is improved. And this has actually shown benefit from a um, cardiac function standpoint as well. And then lastly, myocarditis, as we discussed earlier today, we know very little about the connection between COVID-19 and um, myocarditis. So I'll look to Coxsackie virus as a potential model. From the, looking at this studies of Coxsackie virus, it's clear that damage to the myocardium occurs through two phases. The first is an acute virus-induced damage, and we do believe that SARS-CoV-2 has similar cardiac tropism due to the expression of the ACE2 enzyme on myocardial cells. However, we don't know if it has direct cytotoxicity, such as the Coxsackie virus. Phase two is likely to be important, though, um, if we do believe the connection between COVID-19 and myocarditis, where lymphocyte infiltration and molecular mimicry can cause an autoimmune response. So in the end, I believe that the underlying mechanisms by which COVID-19 causes cardiovascular disease is likely to be heterogeneous, but clearly much more information is needed and this further investigation is warranted. So in conclusion, COVID-19 can cause or exacerbate cardiac dysfunction. Acute cardiac injury is likely to occur via heterogeneous mechanisms, is my thought. And the true prevalence, clinical manifestations, and optimal treatment of cardiac dysfunction are unknown at this point and certainly warrant further study. So with that, I wanted to open it up for questions, um, certainly people may have 
many questions about the great work that Dr. Maioli and her team did. And I'll just keep these questions up there. These are some um, questions that have come up as I've been thinking about this, but, but we want to open it up for other people to have a chance to ask questions. Yeah, Dr. Kwan. Are you there, Dr. Kwan? Hmm. Let me go to somebody else. Dr. Marek? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, it's Paul Marek here from the other side of the world. So I have a few points. So recent data suggests that patients with COVID do not develop typical ARDS and we put them on ventilators and ventilate them inappropriately. So the question is how much of the acute lung injury is due to COVID and how much is due to ventilator induced lung injury? The second question is we now know pretty well that these pa patients present with a hypercoagulable state. So many suffer from PE and secondly, many may have microvascular disease. So I think when doing these autopsies, it's kind of important to look for both macro and microvascular disease. I'm not sure if any of you have any comments on that. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Marshall. Thank you so much. Uh, so those were exactly some areas we wanted to highlight because um, there's so much um, questions about the hypercoagulability in these patients and the presence of microthrombi particularly, but also um, you know, the larger macrovesicular DVT, PE type things. So in um, two of our patients, um, subsegmental pulmonary emboli were identified, but no larger uh, pulmonary emboli. Um, and then in the uh, microscopic evaluations of all these cases so far, um, we have specifically been trying to identify microthrombi in the vasculature, particularly the lungs, um, as well as the kidneys. And so far, we have not found definitive evidence of that in these cases. Um, we are hoping to have more um, opportunity to evaluate autopsies in these patients, and we'll continue to look for that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Marshall, do you want to keep going? I see that there have been a couple questions for you. Do you want to keep going with um, those question series? Let's see. Where would that be? Do, is uh, it? So let's see. I see a question about, do you believe that microvascular damage um, due to microscopic infarction is more likely to be creating this than primary myocarditis per se is an interesting question that maybe you could speak okay. to. Yes, definitely. Okay, so yes, I have been keeping a tally of these um, questions to answer. So that's the other major one is, um, you know, the question of the myocarditis and the myocardial injury in these patients. Um, and like Heather mentioned and went over, um, so far in, the, in this case series, we just have the one patient that clinically was very concerning for myocarditis uh, that we did find these uh, findings. Um, there was a, there's a comment and a question, you know, how do we define myocarditis um, pathologically? And in this case, there was, in, in particularly the right ventricle and other areas, um, there were areas that were uninvolved, but it was pretty patchy and you could find it in multiple samples of this predominantly lymphocytic inflammation. It was septal, it was perivascular, but it was um, definitely um, interacting um, with the myocytes and 
having actual myocyte injury and myocyte necrosis related to this. The question of is this more like to be, you know, the a stress cardiomyopathy or, or focal, you know, um, myocardiocyte injury, and this is reaction to that. Um, that's a good question. I feel like in those patients where you see microscopic dropout of, of cells and microscopic injury, um, you would expect to see more of a neutrophilic response, um, particularly with the acute nature of the myocyte injury. I mean, these were contraction bands, these were dropout, and it was associated with lymphocytic inflammation. And we reviewed this with cardiac pathologists as well. And so this case is a myocarditis, but then there's the other question of this patient also having influenza and there were good questions about, well, how can we tell? And I think it would be great if we are able to also um, evaluate uh, PCR for flu in this heart, just to help answer some more questions. Let's see. And let me see the other. Yeah, I think those were the main ones that I wanted to talk about was the myocarditis, uh, the thrombi question. Um, we've also had some interest, you know, if, if there is um, immune complex deposition. Um, so that's a question we could try to address, um, particularly around, well, any of the injury that we're seeing in the tissue. And there's a lot of interest as well in the, the kidney and the acute kidney injury and what's going on there. Um, so we're going to be looking at that as well. Um, Dr. Marshall, if I could just jump in. So I see a number of questions regarding the uh, relationship between the ACE2 protein and the role of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in the comment. Um, so this is a data point that we looked at specifically. And granted, I mean, we only have 12 patients, but only two of our patients were on lisinopril. Um, all other patients were on um, diuretics and um, beta blockers. So that wasn't something that was very prominent in our cohort. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and while I didn't um, focus on the debate about whether ACE inhibitors and ARBs are uh, beneficial or detrimental in this population, um, there have been some more um, recent statements that have come out. Initially, the ACPC had um, produced this statement saying that we should just be continuing ACE inhibitors and ARBs um, for patients that have indications for this. Um, I don't think that there's any indication to be starting these medications de novo um, for patients with COVID-19, uh, but certainly there is more information that's coming out and there are actually ongoing clinical trials that are looking at ARBs um, to see if it could be um, beneficial there's kind of a, science, a basic science rationale on both sides of the fence that they could be beneficial or they could be detrimental. Um, and I think that further um, clinical information will be helpful. Okay, great. I'm seeing a couple of other questions. Uh, Dr. Kwan may be able to answer if we could try to unmute him one more time. Let's see if he can ask his question. Dr. Kwan. We still can't hear, I'm sorry. Um, so I was going through some additional questions that were popping up. Um, someone was asking about um, the, you know, the hypercoagulability and if there were problems with um, clotting in lines, particularly with the renal replacement therapy. And this is out of my, wheelhouse, but I was communicating with um, one of the um, doctors over in New Orleans um, who has been dealing with this issue and uh, thinks they may have found some solutions so I can try to connect people up with him um, to discuss that. And then another excellent question with the heart involvement is what do we think about the cardiac conduction system and the, the sudden cardiac deaths that have been reported in younger people? Um, we are still evaluating that for sure. Um, we're looking at the conduction system in the cases that had full autopsy. And moving forward, we're, we're hoping to have um, more full autopsies happening. Um, we have an autopsy on a patient from our medical uh, system. 
that was performed and were pending, but the presentation was uh, with AV node block. The patient did have a history of TAVR, but it was kind of a delayed AV block in the setting of, of COVID and respiratory um, involvement. So we'll be seeing what that shows. And additionally, we'll continue to be looking at that as we are unfortunately having younger patients to autopsy as well. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. And I wanted to give Dr. Chuck Murray a chance to ask his question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just, just a quick audio check, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, uh, super helpful presentation. Uh, thanks you guys very much. My question is there is a, a group of researchers who are very interested in bringing uh, whatever we can from our own laboratories to bear on this problem. Uh, is it possible to obtain samples from the autopsy cases for, for molecular biological analyses, further you know, immunohistochemistry and that sort of thing? Oh yeah, thank you so much, Chuck. Um, we, are, have, we have a lot of requests um, to try to allow different researchers to um, address their questions and um, we are wanting to actively work with people. So um, the state of the tissue, it's a little bit um, different amounts or different preparations in some of it. So we'll be needing to go back and look. Um, we'll also be having to work with medical examiners to, for releasing tissue if there is some, but we definitely are actively working on that um, and we'll be very interested in doing that. Uh, we are um, working to collaborate um, with one of the doctors at the NIH um, on the brain question. There's, you know, like the main areas we've kind of been highlighting are the heart involvement, what's going on with the kidneys, and there are patients that are having this kind of unexplained encephalopathy. Some of that may be related to um, sedation with, in, with uh, intubation, but it may not be. And like we showed in our one case, um, where we did see these like focal um, hemorrhages in the subarachnoid space as well as in the brain stem, um, which did not have obvious, you know, microthrombi there, obvious ischemic changes. So the question is, is there more of like a CAR T cell type neurotoxicity with cytokine thing going on? Are there microthrombi? Are there other things? So that's one of the areas. Um, and we're just going to continue to try to work with, with outside folks and get tissues. And we are currently um, working on an in-house um, protocol at the University of Washington. Um, this is still preliminary, where we may be able to provide some limited autopsies on highly selected COVID patients. We have very limited um, capacity, um, but also in the mind of forward thinking and collecting tissue at the time so that we can enable these important studies. Yeah, it would be great if, you know, if some tissue could be preserved fresh, for example, fresh frozen, so that uh, it would be easier to get uh, RNA extractions and things like that done from it as well. Um, yes. We can take this offline. Th thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Um, I know that Dr. Marshall, Dr. Maoli, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have offline.